Hello, my name is Michelle, and you're listening to Profit is a Choice. Joining us today is Andy Seeley, CEO and co-founder of Creatively Disruptive, which is a digital marketing agency built by, as they call it, a team of professional nerds that works together as small business champions. Andy is a small business marketing expert committed to helping businesses keep up with the latest algorithms, which we know kind of feel like they're shifting. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and making sure that they get their money's worth for their online advertising. And um, we're going to talk um, a lot today about remarketing campaigns um, and about just email marketing and why it is so important. And so I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Every day, empowered entrepreneurs are taking ownership of their company financial health and enjoying the rewards of reduced stress and more creativity. With my background as a financial software developer, owner of multiple businesses in the interior design industry, educator and speaker, I coach women in the interior design industry to increase their profits, regain ownership of their bottom line, and to have fun again in their business. Welcome to Profit is a Choice. Hi, Andy. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. I'm happy to be here. I am so glad to talk to you today. Um, before we get started in kind of the meat and potatoes around marketing, um, share with our listeners, if you would, Andy, a little bit of your history and your story and what brought you to create the firm Creatively Disruptive. Yeah, we, um, we started the firm in uh, 2015. Six years ago, it was a spin-off company from another firm that uh, I owned, another uh, media outlet. It was more of a media outlet than a, than a marketing agency um, that focused on tourism. So we did a lot of work with restaurant, sorry, restaurants and resorts and hotels and, and you know, tourism type activities and so forth in the Reno Tahoe area. <laughs> I think we had San Francisco, um, San Diego and uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Funny enough, we you know we ended up selling that media company um, mainly because we we felt a little restricted to who we could help, um, and we were definitely going down the media consultancy kind of route with that company, even though we were a media company in itself. I mean, I found myself oftentimes talking to clients with with that company and saying, "Hey, you should you should also be advertising in this medium and doing these things," which had nothing to do with what I was selling them. And I was like, you know, maybe we need to actually be looking at another kind of way to to do this where we can really help businesses. And I and I like the thought of being able to help a lot of s smaller businesses that weren't necessarily tied to just tourism, right? And 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 local locale areas. I wanted to help uh, businesses all over the all over the country and potentially all over the world. And that's kind of like where it came. And I, and I met up with my cousin um, and he's much more technical and he's much more on the, the analytical technical kind of side of things. I'm much more of on the messaging and, um, and the, and the revenue driving side of things. And it was a, a little bit of a match made in heaven. And, you know, six years later, we're doing phenomenally well with 80 plus clients um, across the United States, the UK, and Australasia, and things are going really well. And 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 then obviously, you know, the last, you know, what's been going on the last year or two years has really kicked things off to another level altogether with with the pandemic and and the the push towards online. Um, you know, the online industry has is probably you're really starting to hit a golden age at the moment. And so you know, feel very blessed, and um, it's been a, a, a nice, nice journey. And then prior to that, other business that we had, I was I was in television. I was in a I was a, a sales director for a television for a number of years. So we've we've always been in the media kind of realm. That's awesome. So quite the varied career there. Yeah, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> Never boring that way. Well, Andy, you and I had just started having some conversation when I was like, hold up, hold up. I need to hit the play button or the record button because we don't want to miss this. You had um, one of the things that I really wanted to focus on in our conversation today were a couple of things. One is you, I know that you love to talk about tools and strategies to increase digital visibility. Um, and that's so important 
I think everything's becoming number one. We know it's digital, but also, you know, video and all these things. And as you know, the listeners here are mostly those that are in the interior design industry. So the things that we're doing are um, making other things more beautiful. And so it's very visual in nature um, that people yeah. want to look at what we do, right? So many of our design art, the, the clients of the designers in the in the workrooms and the stagers that that I support, you know, they're usually hanging out on Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram and and, and places like that. And then in some cases, you know, when you're moving more into a corporate setting, we may see LinkedIn pop up a bit more. But um, I, you had mentioned to me, and I think this is interesting. So I'd, I'd like to start a little bit with what you were sharing with me about your story of looking for a designer and what you noticed was missing just from your own right. research. And then let's, let's parlay that, if you will, into... Um, for those of us listening, how we can take the lessons learned from somebody who was looking for a designer and what, what you saw. And then, you know, how we could solve that if, if we are in our area, because it's, it's often where we get the most insight when we talk to somebody who's kind of, if you will, worked through our process or gone through it and said, hey, wait, hold up. Something's missing. Yeah. You mentioned that you and your wife had um, bought a home in the greater Phoenix area uh, a little over a year ago, I think you said. Yep. Yep. We, yeah, we bought, sorry, we, we bought, bought a, a home in the greater Phoenix area about <clears throat> 11 months ago. And we didn't, you know, we did buy, a, we, we, we have bought a home, we're living in it. Um, and at the time, um, and probably still to a degree now, although as you start getting furniture and stuff into the house, it makes it harder and harder, right? Um, but right. at the time, we we were like, okay, we've got this this nice nice size home. It's about three thousand square feet. Um, we want to have it feel like a vacation, right? We kind of like wanted it to be like a res- build it like a resort. We built a backyard and a pool and you know everything around it and. Our first thought was we should find a design a designer to give us some you know pointers and to help us in the direction and and you know we, we and we had if I'm honest we had zero knowledge of even how interior design firms work or you know how it goes or whatever so as most people would do we go onto Google start looking for interior design companies and if I'm honest it's it was a very fractured all over the place very disorganized kind of result. That we got you know it was hard to find any um at least with our google searches and so forth and then most of them that came up they didn't they didn't quite feel quite right they felt a little dis- a little disorganized that was the impression that we got and you know even though we had looked at a, at a few design um companies websites and so forth um after doing some pretty serious searching <laughs> there was no like follow-up there was no um there was no there was no efforts to capture our email addresses to to continue talking to us and to to remarket to us there was no remarketing efforts or very little remarketing efforts going on meaning there wasn't you know typically like for us give it give give you an example if you go to creativelydisruptive.com there's a good chance that that when you leave it that you'll get follow-up ads on Facebook and Instagram, where where there'll be ads kind of like of, of ours coming up, um, remarketing to you because we know that you've come to our website, and now it's like okay, well we know that they come to our website now. We, that show that shows that there's some kind of interest, some kind of intent. So we want to stay in front of them and top of mind because oftentimes it's not quite right, right? It's not but not the right timing or whatever. There's a lot of reasons why somebody might go to your website and not be a customer and. That doesn't mean that you don't that you just forget about them. It means okay, we need to build that list of people that at some point looked at your website because that shows intent. That shows that maybe they are thinking about something or they've got something on their mind, and we want to make sure that we're continuously marketing. There was none of that. We never got any kind of remarketing um, to us, and ultimately it was just a little bit. Um, you know, we, we just never really found the right person. We never really felt like we connected with anybody. And it didn't, it seemed like a bit of an industry that was disinterested, if I'm honest. And we had a budget. We, 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 we didn't have a mass, it wasn't a massive budget, but it was in the, you know, thousands or tens of thousands that we were potentially going to look to to put towards this. Um, so it would have been a decent little job, I'm, I'm thinking. 
again, really not knowing the industry and, and how much things cost and everything, I have no clue because we didn't end up use, working with a d designer. My wife ended up finding a local neighbor that has some design experience and they kind of hashed it out together and figured some stuff out. And, you know, I think they've done a decent job, but I, I always wonder, you know, I wonder what the experience would have been if we actually found a professional and how that would have gone and, and how much happier we might have been. And, you know, obviously, you know, if we were going down a route that we were really happy with, maybe we would have ended up spending more, but maybe we would have been happier um, with the results. So, sure. you know, my, my takeaway was that it, it felt like as an industry, at least in the Phoenix area, that from a marketing standpoint, a, a winning of client standpoint, it was kind of a very much a second rate thing. We actually spoke to one interior designer, but it was a big turnoff, if I'm honest. She was very, uh, it felt like she was just a little bit too busy for us and, you know, gave loads of restrictions as to when uh, she could come over for the initial consult and, 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 I, and she was asking for a payment to just to, to come and have that initial consult, which I'm, I'm sure is not unreasonable. And I didn't think that was unreasonable, but I felt it was unreasonable that it was like, hey, one, you're going to pay for me to come over. And two, I'm going to come over whenever I would like to come over, which wasn't always very good for us um, because we, you know, we've got a little boy and I, I, I'm running a company and blah, blah, blah. And we ended up just saying, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And there was no ongoing marketing even from her, even though she had our email email addresses, even though she had a lot of information, there was no ongoing kind of like follow-up you know she didn't know, necessarily know that we kind of got turned off by her attitude and maybe we could have had that turned around if we actually saw some stuff and and saw how our processes were and so forth and it just seemed like a a little bit of a and I don't know if, it, if it's if it's normal but uh you know I've spoken to friends and, and family that have actually looked in this too and it's always been a little bit of a scary a scary industry to get involved with, uh, mainly because it seems a little aloof, if that makes sense. And um, that seems to be what I've heard from from many. And it doesn't need to be that way. I I, I think when I think of if I like, you know, and I'm not an interior designer at all, but let's say I was, let's like you know, wave my magic wand and turn myself into an interior designer, but keeping my digital marketing hat on, you know, what interior designers develop is amazing potential content right it's it's uh, content is is keen in um you know in online marketing and digital marketing content is is the key part to success i would imagine that if i was a, a pretty good graphic designer there would be a lot of things that i could look at i apologize i've got a little puppy here that uh is barking so if it's coming through on the on the, on the call i apologize in advance there is a lot of opportunity, though. So, so let's talk about what those opportunities are. I wrote down a couple of things that you said. Um, and before we jump into that, I, I will share with you. Number one, I think you also um, fell into what a lot of people have fallen into. And that is these last 11 months, even probably all the way back to about. Yeah, I guess we're probably maybe even 12 to 14 months our industry has exploded. And I, when I say stupid busy, I mean crazy stupid busy um, to the point that everybody got sent home. So the same way your business has kind of exploded with everything moving online, our business and our industry has exploded with everybody moving home and going, oh, snap, I need to change this house because I'm sitting in these, you know, four walls, if you will. And so some of what you may have picked up from that particular designer that you spoke with, that busyness and that hurriedness is actually probably the stressed out nature of our industry right now. We, um, I have some of my clients that I'm not even kidding you, Andy, they are booked out. All, we're recording this in around um, mid-August. They are booked out through the end of 2022 going into 2023 with people just waiting. Um, and I'm hearing it everywhere because we cannot physically, number one, get to them fast enough. But number two, um, the cost of everything is going up and we can't get supplies because of, you know, COVID and then things traveling in and the, the breaks and everything. So we are dealing with an industry right now 
where there is a huge demand. It's booming. It sounds like it's booming. Huge demand, a lot of overwhelm, and then a lot of, now, how do I do this? Now, I'm also going to say there is a, an entire area of those designers that are new or that are in areas that maybe right there can't support what they do, right? So maybe they're in a more rural area and they have to drive into you know, a more metropolitan area to do their work. That happens a lot as well. And so, you know, we, we see a little bit of everything. So number one, I hate the, that all that happened to you, <laughs> but I will say just, you know, to give grace to the industry, everybody is is just crazy right now. It sounds like, I mean, it sounds like from a marketing standpoint that marketing, it's, it's a little bit like contractors because we work with a number of contractors, a few contractors yes. actually. Many contractors don't really need a lot of more work. They've got a lot of work, and they uh, they're actually overwhelmed. Although, a couple of the couple of contractors that we work with, obviously, they're in the same situation, but they're looking for a certain type of work. Same. And and just waiting for people to reach out to you through, and what they've learned is just waiting for people to reach out to you through referrals kind of takes the control out of your business as to who you want to work with. Obviously, you know, with referrals, if you if you've got a a high end client that's referring someone, it's probably likely another high end client. But maybe it's a high end client in a certain area that you want to be working with. Maybe it's it's certain types of design that 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 you want to attract people that like that kind of design. Um, because just because someone's a high end client might not be a good fit. Right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think with the digital marketing, and that's what uh, you know, our contractors definitely have found is that they can attract that client that's right for them. And I know for us, for our marketing ourselves, we we, we try to attack, attract a certain kind of client, right? We, we, we want a certain type of client that we know we're going to have the most chance of success. And we want to limit the, the kind of clients that we're not going to have as much success with. And not saying that those client, that those people that we want to limit are not good for somebody else. Exactly. They're just not right for us. And we're actually, in reality, we're not we're very good for them. We're not, we wouldn't be the right fit for them. And I think digital marketing is not just about being busy. It's about actually crafting your business with the right client base on your demand, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Totally would agree with that. So, so let me, I want to back up and talk about you, one of the things that I made note of was you said they didn't even try to catch my email. Talk a little bit about the right way to catch an email. I mean, there's certainly a lot of wrong ways to catch it. <laughs> right. Right. And, and we know about that. And that, you know, I think I know that even I sometimes am fearful of not having, you know, double authentication or everybody like agreeing 14 times that I can email them. And so I, I sometimes even get hesitant without really making sure that I can email somebody. And then I have others that turn around and if they even see my email somewhere else, they're snagging it and emailing me so that, you know, you see, I guess what I'm saying here, Andy, is we see things on both sides. Talk to us a little about a little bit about what is probably, I'm going to say the best way, the most relational way that doesn't feel salesy and ick. Sometimes when people want my email, it feels ick. Um, how, what is the best way if somebody, ha, if you had visited an interior design website looking, let's say you had done your Google search, it had given you um, four or five really great um, results. You went to that website. Let's talk about that for just a minute from a digital perspective. What would you have said was a right and a great and a feel good way to gather your email? And then I want to talk to you about what we would do with that. Yeah. So email marketing, the best email marketing is never, Hey, come and do business with me. Here's 5% off, right? That's, that's, that's not good email marketing or, Hey, uh, sign up to my email list um, and get ten dollars off the you ten dollars off an order or or fifty percent off the order or whatever whatever it is that in my mind that's really not what you're looking for what you look what you're looking for especially in in industries where there's a lot of IP where, where it's intellectual property which definitely interior designers it's ideas right it's a it's a shopping and selling of ideas and we're in the same kind of thing it's it's knowledge and ideas and thoughts and the best way in my mind and and if i again if i put my you know if i became an interior designer where we would go with this would be to build a list which is full of 
fear of missing out kind of feelings. So it's it's like, um, hey, if you're interested, you know, sign up to my email list and get some timely um, tips and ideas on how to you know design you know design your home um, or build the the home of your dreams kind of thing, right? Where because people are always looking for ideas, and especially if somebody's gone to your website you know that that's what they're looking for. You know, 90% of the people that are probably going to a, the interior designer's website are, are trying to find ideas, trying to get answers, trying to get thoughts, trying to figure out, you know, what are the, what they're looking for. I mean, the reason why people hire inter- interior designers from my standpoint as somebody who's going to hire one is that we're a bit bereft of ideas. <laughs> right, we, right. We know kind of what what we want to feel when we walk into our house, but we like how do we how do we create that with actual things and a plan? Exactly. I love that you said that. So if all of my designers are listening here, we talk about it all the time. We're selling feelings, not things. And so right. you just hit the nail on the head for that one. Okay. So we want to create this, let's let's call it this trade, right? Um, I'm going to give you these tips, these tricks, these ideas, these inspirations, something. And in exchange, you're going to give me your email address and then I'm going to be able to send you all this great information as we go. Yep. Okay. And the idea is that you're sending information that I'm going to be interested in looking at. Um, what you don't want to be get at doing is getting people's e- emails and then just spamming them with a whole bunch of stuff about what you want. Right. Because. Right. And, and with interior design, um, what I would be, if I sound, signed up to that, I'd be wanting to see some examples of some stuff that you've done, um, some thoughts on, on on color palettes and different things that are going on. The best people, at, at least from an IP online marketing, you know, email, email marketing standpoint that I've seen have been people that are prepared to share pre- pretty much everything. They're not, they're not holding back. They're not like, you know, they're not going to show you how to make uh, a Kentucky Fried Chicken with with seven spices, right? Um, they're going to how many spices in Kentucky Fried Chicken? I, can't I don't know, but I think it's a lot. More than seven, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, we're not going to like show you ninety percent of it or or eighty percent of it, and not uh, so so it's like okay, I have to hire this person to actually really uh, actually understand how this works. Most really good marketing, they, they kind of share it all. We share it all. We literally share every single thing that we know because it's not just about the knowledge of doing it. Some people are DIYers. Some people are going to try to do it themselves. They're going to take your knowledge and they're going to try to do it themselves. Or they might even learn how to do it. You might in, end up inspiring them to be interior designers. Who knows? But the majority of the people, probably 95% of the people that you're speaking to, don't have the time for it, don't have the inclination for it, and they just need to know that somebody's good at it and, and that they feel really, that, hey, Michelle, she's the girl for me. She's going to actually be able to make my house you know, feel exactly how I want it to feel. And you know, engendering that is kind of where you want to do go and, and being very free with your knowledge is a very powerful way of convincing somebody to do business with you. And the power of email is that it doesn't cost you anything once you've got it. So it costs you some effort and it costs you sharing some of your knowledge, but you're not paying 50 cents a click. Right. Right. And it, and it, and, and it's something that's very shareable. It's something that like, let's say I signed up to your email and I was getting emails. I'm like, man, I really like Michelle's work. Maybe I'll, I'll hire her. Maybe I do hire her, but, and then I continue getting it emails and, and and stuff from you where it's interesting stuff. It's not you advertising to me. It's you sharing interesting things about interior design and so forth. I'm much more likely to share it with my sister. I'm much more sh- likely to share it with other friends and family members who might, who I know might be looking, who might have just bought a home or, or so forth. And again, that's all free. And I'm likely to do that um, because I'm like, Hey, this uh, Michelle's putting out some really good stuff. I, I, I want to help my friend by introducing her to Michelle and then they they maybe sign up to your email list as well. And they say that over time an email list is worth, you know, $25 an email, right? Because obviously not everybody's going to ever do business with you. But if you end up having a hundred thousand emails, you know, 25 times a hundred thousand, you know, 2.5 it was 2.5 million worth of, of emails, right? Um and with different industries, that number is even higher. So that's 25 is like of all emails. That's emails selling, you know, $1 products up to, you know, whatever. So 
the higher end cost, um, those emails are worth even more over time. And it's tremendously effective. In fact, some of our clients, because we do paid advertising is probably a specialty. We do Facebook. Um, obviously, Facebook and Instagram are the same platform, just slightly different presentations. And we do Google. We do CRO, which is conversion rate optimization, which is the new SEO, I guess, which is building websites that convert and get results. And, you know, we do email marketing and the email marketing over time ends up becoming about 30% to 40% of a company's business in conjunction with the paid advertising. The other thing about email marketing is if I do business with you, let's say, Michelle, you come in and you help us with our home. What's the chances in a couple of years we want to make some changes? What's the, what's the chances that we might want to update some things? What's the chances that we might want to do X, Y, Z? Now, we might have have run with what your what your idea was, what your what your thought was with our design, and and can do some stuff ourselves. But there's a, also a good chance that we might re reach out to you and say, Hey, Michelle, we'd like to have you come back in, and we want to redo some things. Can you give us some thoughts? And and being connected by email keeps you connected with us. You know, you, you see this with um, real estate agents. I mean, we had a really nice real estate agent that helped us purchase this house and she stays in touch with us and she actually does a very good job. She's not saying, hey, would you like to sell your house and just constantly pushing stuff on us. She just sends little things out and just can, stays connected with us. Um, and, you know, if we end up selling our house and she stays connected with us and we had a good experience with her, What's the likelihood that one, we might refer her to somebody else, one of our friends, or two, we will use her again. And it's um, it's a powerful thing. And I'm I'm sure a lot of your a lot of a lot of your 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 listeners probably do some things, but where where I would highly recommend them to go would be down the route of just being open and sharing and not not hold everything in. We we literally like we actually have a course, Michelle, that we have got out there. If you go to creativelydisruptive.com, we have a course and you can actually sign up for free. Now we, we actually say pay what you can, but we say, pay whatever you want. And it's actually literally all of our knowledge and how to market yourself as a small business owner online. That's everything. Cause we actually, it's actually a platform that we use to market out to help train our new staff members. And so you could pay if you want to, but that'll be up to you or you could do zero. And you can actually sign up. And what we get out of that is one, you get your email address. Um, you get to see that we know what we're doing. And it's a lot of information, as you could imagine, with digital marketing. Um, but we basically just we, we give you 100% of our knowledge base. Our, our bet is that you're too busy or just don't have the inclination to do it. You know, that's, but let's talk about that for just a second, Andy, because I think that is definitely something to hit on. You know, I had heard one time you can tell somebody what to do all day long, but the difference is, do they have the time and the ability to do it? And that's why I know when I talk about when people are hiring us, they're not just hiring us for what we know. They're hiring us for the expertise to implement it. Right. Um, kind of like I said to somebody, I said, look, I know how to pull your tooth. I've watched plenty of YouTube videos. But you probably don't want me to do it. I can't say that I have the expertise in it, but I can say I have the knowledge. And so sharing knowledge shouldn't be anything that's scary. Um, even like you mentioned, not even understanding maybe how a full interior design process worked or how the process worked for that designer. Even just having a document that says how to choose the right designer for you, um, what our process looks like, does it fit what you're looking for? And then you can create all kinds of information that actually set them up to to what I would like to say is self-edit. They're either self-editing out, you're not my person, or they're self-editing in, hey, let's go to the next stage, because so far this sounds great and exactly what I'm looking for. And if we don't give them enough information to do that, um, for me, I know one of the things that I like to do if somebody signs up for a discovery call, um, I want to make sure that they've got lots of information before we get on the call together so that they they already have a lot. Like I've already taught them stuff, sent them emails, sent them webinars, sent them educational content so that they are more ready if they have if they have consumed that data and that knowledge and that information. Like you said, they know that I know what I'm doing. And by the time we get on the call, it's really just a timing kind of issue or an, an investment level kind of issue at that point. And so um 
It just makes all the difference. Right. And I'd say there's two types of customers that you can go after. There's the one that wants affordability and, they, and they're constantly focused on pricing, right? Most of us, I mean, we don't, we don't focus on that client. That's definitely a client that we're looking to avoid. We look, we're, what we're looking for is clients that want a result, right? They're focused on the result that they're looking for. Um, we're, not, we're not looking for somebody who's, who wants to hire a digital marketer and the most important thing is to get it to be as cheap as possible. And I'm not, at, you know, they, all, the, all their conversation with us when we're talking to them, you know, we do discovery calls to figure out if we're the right fit. We're not looking, you know, th- that person's constantly asking how much is it and, and what, you know, and they, they don't want to talk about what their budgets are. And they, it's, it's all about money and how, and costs and so forth. Welcome to, welcome to interior design. That's right. the same thing that happens to us, right. right? And that's a, that's a bad, that's a client that we're actively looking to avoid, right? Because yes. Yes. what we're looking for is we're looking for somebody who's, fit, who's focused on the result because the two different, and, and it's the same with, with every high, you know, if, if you're if you're looking to be a high end designer, if you're looking to be a high end digital marketer, um, the result driven clients is where you want to be because the the price of your service is less important to them than the result that they're ultimately going to get. And if we're if we're constantly, you know, you know, getting those people that are looking to spend nothing then we're, 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 we're running downhill and we're basically, you know, the, the, the winner of that battle actually is the loser, right? Right. I made a comment one time. I, I was not going to engage in a race to the bottom. Right. And the difference between the two is this. The person that's looking for the result is, is looking to find someone they can trust. That, that they, they look at and they go, I trust that this person can actually get me the result. Because the result is so important to them, they're prepared to pay the money, but they need to know, they need to have that trust that they're not going to be let down, right? The person who who wants to pay as little as possible, they're a little bit less worried about the result because they're not even thinking about it because they're just thinking about how much it costs. And when it doesn't work out for them, um, they're not so bothered by it. But if you can give them a cheap rate, they'll probably work with you, Right. Now, the, the high-end client that was what pretty much m- most of us want, they're looking for that trust. They're looking to feel like, okay, Michelle, she's, she's, she's the one. I found her. I finally found the person that I'm going to work with. She understands me. She gets me. She's going she's gonna to do a really good job for me. And that's where good digital marketing and good content comes in, right, where you're sharing yourself, where you're where you're showing that you trust, trust your clients as much as you want your, tr- your clients to trust you. And you can do that and it, and it can be tremendously powerful. Now, as I said, granted, you're going to end up getting people that are going to take some of your information and they're going to run with it themselves. But you know, you never get them to be your client anyway. So what are you losing? You're not really losing anything, especially when it comes to digital marketing, because there's a, a hundreds of you know, thousands of searches and, and, and so forth everywhere. And in a large large metropolitan city there's tens of thousands of people every month looking for your services possibly even more than that right and if you're if you're a designer that's prepared to travel um even nationwide there's probably millions of searches so there's a bottomless pit of potential customers where i would always suggest that somebody who's looking to sell a product or a service at a high ticket it needs to be about engendering trust and you need to Need and whilst you're asking me as a client to trust you, you need to be showing your 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 clients that you trust them by saying, "Hey, I'm I'm an open book. This is who we are. This is how we do our thing." That is tremendously attractive, and we've seen that time and time and time again. The clients that we work with that operate that way have tremendous success. And for us as marketers, we've got almost a never-ending cavalcade of of content that we can share, which excites the market even more. And I think, you know, as, as an interior designer, you know, you would have a lot of great photography. You might have some great videography. You could probably, you know, sit down with a camera in front of you and just talk about different aspects of design. And there's a, a tremendous amount of great um, content that these platforms love, like Facebook and Instagram love that stuff. Like the algorithms, as they start seeing people showing an interest in a genuine way, which is you being open and showing really good information, those algorithms will start seeing the reactions of your audiences 
and the algorithm will start rewarding you and it becomes a a bit of a snowball and you know in the end you, you end up having you know a tremendous amount of incoming inquiries from people who are willing to pay what you want to pay because again they're not concerned about how much you're charging they're concerned that you're going to deliver a result so how often do the, all the algorithms change andy um the algorithm is pretty much the same it just goes about things differently constantly <laughs> so right right so like the algorithm in a, in a nutshell if i talk about the same but different <laughs> the, the same part of it is what the algorithms are looking for because if you think about let's talk about facebook and instagram if you think about those two platforms if it wasn't for us it would be an empty space right it's just a platform with things that we can actually do so facebook and instagram need us to actually make them relevant right because we're, we're uploading the content we're putting things on it we're putting things in there that people find interesting that causes many people to come back several times a day to their platform and because we're putting up interesting information um, or not inf interesting information, depending on who it is, you know, that's causing people to, to fear missing missing something out on that platform, which causes those people to go back multiple times, which then allows Facebook and Instagram to serve ads to those people that keep coming back because they want eyeballs coming back constantly. Um, and that's how they make their money. They make their money through people coming back constantly to see what's going on. So Facebook and Instagram, well, Facebook is Instagram, but Facebook basically looks at that and they go, okay, we're going to reward those that are producing the best content. We're going to reward those that are producing content that people uh, are engaging with, that people are enjoying, that people are seeing, that people are searching for because that's the content that's keeping them coming back. That's the content that's allowing us to serve more ads up and make more money. So the algorithm's constantly looking for users that are producing great content and, and, and not just great content, but great content that people engage with and they're having conversations and are building communities around, right? Okay. So, and the algorithm hasn't changed with that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very much biased algorithm around engagement now the engagement factor can sometimes be negative as well right so you know you see all the outrage posts and so forth especially with politics and so forth where people there's massive engagement because everyone's yelling at each other the algorithm unfortunately keys in on that as well and they go okay well this really seemed to get michelle interested and maybe all it does was make you angry and it will start serving more stuff up to you of that type. So if just to give you a little hint, if you're sick of what Facebook's serving up and it feels like it's just a place where a lot of stuff that annoys you gets served up, it's probably because you're interacting with it. If you stop interacting with it, if you give yourself a month of only interacting with stuff that you love, Facebook will become a platform of stuff that you love. Interesting. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and and if if we as as um, small business owners and you know and, and your your community as, as interior designers want to make Facebook a better place, post all your wonderful stuff, all the wonderful imagery, all the ideas and, 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 and things that you've got going on. And you can play your role in changing that. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to enjoy what you're doing. They're going to interact with it. And Facebook will serve them up more of it. And they will serve you up more to more people because people are interacting with it and enjoying it. And so that algorithm is you know has, has slightly modified but it's always trying to do that same thing right it has the underlying um yeah that's the underlying kind yeah. of like bedrock of what facebook's all about the things that change all the times is how it's done and and that can be a pain in the butt and every like stuff we were doing this time last year doesn't work now right because the way we've got to put it together the way we put it up so it's a constant there is an element of a constant battle with just knowing you know how they've changed the the, the processes and how they put things in and what priorities there are. And um, there's a lot of more so than we've seen ever before. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, turned down posts or, or they've, they've, they've canceled them out or, or rejected ads and so forth. Facebook, very aggressive about um, rejecting content now. Um, well, I've never seen that. I've ne we've never seen and it's, and it's And it can be, you know, you might, you might put some flowers up and for some reason it gets rejected and it might be just the algorithm looked at it as a different thing that you than what you put up and you you've got to like ask for it to be looked at by a person the person looks like oh it's just some flowers and then they approve it that kind of stuff's happening a lot more now so there's a lot of man more manual late uh management 
that we're seeing, but um, it's still that same immensely powerful platform. There's still, you know, I think it's 170 million people just in the USA that use that have active accounts on Facebook. There's two billion people worldwide. It's the one place where where there's you know I don't think there's one, a place anywhere in the world any media or anything where a small business owner with a limited budget can reach the exact person that they want to reach as easily as they can using Facebook. The problem is right now, and this is a great issue for me to have um, because it is becoming a little bit more complicated because of all of the hoop jumping that needs to be done. And quite frankly, oftentimes small businesses are like, you know, I'm a baker. I want to be baking bread. I don't want to be figuring out how, Mark Zuckerberg wants me to wants to use his platform. I, I I've got to bake bread. I don't I can't be bothered. I'll just hire Andy Seely and his team to to promote my business. So it's good for me to a degree. But I will say, Facebook's constantly trying to figure out how to make it easier. Um, but they're also trying to navigate politics, pe- how people feel about the platform. And that seems to be top of mind right now. But I do know that there's a few things coming up with is, I think it's going to be good for small business owners that want to try and figure it out themselves, but there is still hoop jumping and it, and it changes constantly. So I don't know if I've really confused everybody by just going into that kind of diatribe, but. No, it's good. It's good to know because it's what we're also seeing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know that I had played around in the Facebook ad world for a while um, just for my own business and, Years ago, some things would sell right through and then it, you would get caught on something that you're like, wait a minute, all I did was change the picture or two words. And now the whole thing's caught. Like, what is the deal? So you just, you know, approve that. Let me ask you about another thing real quick. You were talking about the power of remarketing, um, where those ads start coming back in when we're on Facebook and Instagram. And I've got to say, it <laughs> it's crazy because I, I know that I go out and look at some, like, I'll give you an example. I, I like to online shop for clothes. Now I've got my little favorite Instagram influencers. I've got people that I follow things that I see. Number one, I don't have time to go to the stores. Number two, during COVID, you know, there wasn't really the place you wanted to be. So you were doing more online shopping, looking for something new and different than maybe what I could get in my community stores. And of course I love the little boutiques around me. So I go to the small shops because I love to support local when I can, but I love that. And I would go out and look at something and I'd be like, I don't know. I'm going to think about that. And then for the next week, it was every time I went on Facebook, every time I went on Instagram, everywhere I went, it was like it was in my face, in my face, in my face. And then I was like, I need to go look at that again. Like, I'm really I'm really thinking about that more, even though I knew what was happening. I knew what they were doing. Like I knew that it was remarketing to me. But it still stayed in my face and made me think about it because it stayed top of mind. But in, I'm going to say in a very in my face, but also subtle way. And um, it, it was the combo of the two that would make me go back and look I, I, at it. And I would say, think of remarketing like, you know, you showed an interest in my in, in, in a product and it just wasn't good timing for you at that moment. And I'm just reaching out to say, hey, hey, Michelle, um, you called through and you wanted to buy this dress. Uh, did, did, were you still interested in it? Yeah, I've, I've still got it here. I know it wasn't good time. You really seem to like it. Would you Would you be interested? That's basically what it is, right? And right. many times with marketing, especially with paid marketing, it always drives me crazy when I see this, is people will pay, say, for Google advertising. A lot of people, there's a lot of people that love Google and hate Facebook. And there's a lot of people that like Facebook and hate Google. The reality is the two of them working together you know, magnifies both. And to give you an example, with um, with remarketing, what you're able to do is let's say I let's say I run some Google ads. I'll talk about two different things on remarketing. Let's say I run some Google ads and I'm spending X number of dollars. If I don't have any kind of remarketing, especially you say Facebook or Instagram remarketing backing up that Google dollars, it's a little bit like pouring water on a concrete, you know, on a concrete driveway, right? The water splashes on it wets the concrete, then it flows off, goes in the gutter and rolls down the street and it's gone, right? So I've got water. Sure, there was water on my con- on my concrete for a bit, but within 10 minutes, it's all dry and, and you wouldn't even know if there's anything there. And, and think of that like your website. You're pouring traffic onto your website. Sure, there's people there. Something might happen during that moment, 
And when they've gone, they're gone and, and it's gone, right? If you actually max, uh, match that up with, say, a little bit of a remarketing campaign on Facebook, all that Google traffic that you're, you're, that you're doing, and I would imagine this would work very well for, for interior designers, have, have your new business or, the, or people that have never heard of you before find you through Google because, you know, if somebody is looking for some interior, decor, interior decorating or interior design help, they're going to type that into Google, right, in the local area. So you, you capture that high intent client that's actively searching for your service at that moment. They go to your website, they have a look, maybe they go and they go, oh, I'm just not so sure, or maybe the timing's not right, or hey, this looks really good, I'll come back to this in a couple of months, right? And they leave. If you don't have remarketing, you've got no control. You're just gonna have to, okay, I hope they come back. You know, I don't know what happened to that traffic, but I hope, it, I hope they come back. If you have that remarketing on Facebook and Instagram, the pixel will pick up that that person arrived and looked and maybe looked at a couple of pages and that would be a very high intent client. And Facebook would will take that and just reserve them your brand to them over and over and over again every time they, they, they go back to Facebook and Instagram. And the key with that, with a remarketing campaign, is kind of like your email marketing campaign, is keep them interested, keep them engaged with you, keep them going, oh, I'm shit. Yeah, I went to her website. I was going to contact her in a couple of months. I forgot about it. I, I need to. I need to reach out to her, right? Because we're we're busy animals. We're running around with our heads cut off all the time. Um, we get distracted by everything. What remarketing can absolutely do is actually re-engage people back into and remind them, hey, you know, I'm Michelle Williams. Remember, you came and checked out our, my website. Maybe you should come back and and revisit me when you know when you're ready. And you can stay engaged with that. In fact, there's lots of different tactics to keep people recirculating through your system. But you can like actively be doing different things with that person for up to 180 days. And typically, somebody will make a decision ins inside that time if you stay connected with them. And that's even if you don't actually, if they haven't even given you anything, they haven't given you their their email address, right? You don't have anything to actually actively reach out to them. It's just the system knows that Andy went to Michelle's website. So now Michelle's gonna stay in touch with him by every time or every other time or every three times that Andy comes to Facebook, Michelle's gonna send a, give a message to him about different things to stay connected with him. And during that process, you might even, there might be the odd thing where you're trying to get my email address, right? So you can really capture me. And I would suggest, Michelle, if there's one thing that, and I know we've been talking for a little bit, but if there's one thing your listeners should really consider is a Google campaign mixed with a remarketing campaign, maybe not even a top of funnel campaign on Facebook or Instagram, but a remarketing campaign so they can recapture the traffic that was on Facebook that does go to their website so they can stay connected and say and say, hey, here's a you know, start sharing all the really great content that they have to fill that person with trust and confidence that you as a designer can get them the result that they're looking for. And on obviously at that point, you know, they're, they're less concerned about how much you're going to charge. They're much more concerned about the result that they're going to get, which is what you want, which is the right client that probably most of us want. Now, if you don't do Google ads, if you don't want to do that, the minimum thing that I would suggest that you do is actually just have a very low level remarketing campaign that doesn't necessarily need to cost you a whole bunch utilizing whatever traffic goes to your website. So when you're going to, you know, mixes and you're rubbing shoulders with people and handing out your cards and somebody goes, you know, what, I'm going to check out a website and they go to your website, you've caught them in, in your Instagram and, and Facebook loop. Um, and it could cost you a few dollars a day, right? But it's tremendously powerful. And it basically turns a lot of your processes into, you know, it's automation rather than you constantly having to do everything, which, you know, is tremendous. I mean, our, our little company, we, we've got two salespeople and we generate two new incoming conversations every single day for each one of those, those people, right? And that allows us to pick and choose who we want to work with as well, right? Because if we, cause we, I know that we could probably deal with, I don't know, fifteen to twenty, you know, new clients would be a big would be a big month for us, you know, when we're choosing who we want to work with. If we're actually 
communicating with 60 people every month, we've got to like choose who we want to work with if we only want to work with 15, right? We can't work with everybody and not everybody wants to work with us, but we are actually actively sluicing through all the dirt. I hate to say it like that, but you know, using the gold, gold mining or the gold uh, panning analogy, we're sluicing through all the dirt to find the nuggets um, and we're actively choosing who we want to work with. And I think, I don't know there's been an, a time ever in the history of small business where we've been able to actively just choose who we want to work with in a way that's not nasty, right? Like we, you're not like saying, don't come into my store and get out, right? right? You're right, actually choosing right. who you want to work with. And more importantly, the system draws in the people that you want to work with. Well, and I think that's what we all want to do, right? And is we want to, like we said earlier, we want to have people almost self-edit so that by the time they come to us, they're almost our raving fans so yeah. that at the time that we are having that conversation, again, they already know that we're about results. Yep. Um, I know I know. even for those that are reaching out to me, I, two things I always find interesting, um, and I'm, I'm willing to tell people, so I've got a discovery form out there. And it asks questions. And and I am shocked by the people that tell me they want massive results. And at the bottom, it says, I want to do this as cheaply as possible, or I have no money to invest. And I'm always curious, why would you reach out to a service provider? Like, how would, if if somebody were to call the interior designer and say, hey, I want you to come design my home for free because I have no money to invest and I want to do it cheaply. I don't know any of my designers that would pick up the phone and think, oh, wow, I'm so excited. Let me call them back. Right. But I'm right. shocked when they have that attitude about their own business. Right. We're, we're, we're creating an entire firm here and they're telling me they don't want to invest in it. And I'm thinking, well, why would you want me to invest in it if you're not going to invest in it? And in digital marketing world. We'll- that uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, I I would like to make a million dollars a year. Currently, I'm making nothing, but I have a $500 budget. So I'd, I'd like- yeah, Or I want to work two hours a week. That's right. the other one. I, 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 yeah. get less of, I, I We get less of the two hour a week thing, but we definitely have, hey, can you please make me a millionaire for $500? And I'm like, we're like, well, um, probably not. It's going to be really tough to do that. Um, we could definitely make- uh, you a million dollars if you've got a product that people care about, um, but you're going to have to put some investment into it. But I think I think that we, we we are able to to avoid a lot of that. And having a well-run funnel, digital marketing funnel, can actually clear out a lot of that. So you can actually have a lot less time wasters and 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 tire kickers. Um, and a lot of times, if I'm honest with you. The reason why you get people say to you, and, and I see this time and time again, oftentimes we'll say, you know, and we have a similar questionnaire when people are booking to have a conversation with us. And we kind of, I, I train my team to ignore the, I don't have any money response. Yeah, we don't, we don't act actively exclude them right away. We still have a conversation with them. And the reason for it is oftentimes the reason why they say they don't have any money is they actually do have money. They're just not sure if they want to tell you that they have money because they don't trust you yet. Right. So having a well-run digital marketing system, which is exactly because you actually nailed it, where by the time they come to you, they're already excited, they're already prepared, they're already ready to go, is tremendous, right? And is and and you can do that. You can get to the point where the client is already they already know what you're doing, so you can have an assumptive conversation. You're not trying to sell them on anything. At that point, you're just helping them. You're just you're the counselor. You're the person in authority. You're the person that has all the answers and the ability to give them the result that they're looking for. And you can actually just assume that they're going to do business with you. And you just wait for them to say, "Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to do business with you." You can just walk through it without asking, "Would you like to do business with me?" You just start doing business with them, and that's kind of how we work. Yeah, we if you if you were to call us and book a call, Michelle. We would ask you a whole bunch of questions, find out what your situation is, see what your what your pain points are, what your difficulties are, and find out what's important to you and what you what you want to accomplish. So we have a good understanding of what results you're looking for and and, and, and the problems that you're dealing with. And then we go through, okay, hey, we found out all this information. Here's what we're going to do to move forward. Uh, let's move forward. And it's just a it's just a, we're just assuming that you're going to do business with us because the conversation, because it's an inbound conversation where you've looked at us and go, OK, these guys are obviously experts and authorities in this space. I'm I'm asking for help because I've got a problem. 
we're actually in a situation where we're talking as a counselor, as a, an authority, um, rather than someone who's chasing a bit of business. And that's a tremendous place for you to be. And as a, as a designer, I think that's where, where designers and, and, and high-performing designers should want to be. It's a little bit like being a doctor, right? A doctor, it's a, it's a business. I mean, you know, but how often do you go into a doctor and you say, well, one, I want to know how much it is and I just want, to, I just want the facts. No, the doctor's going to ask a lot of questions. The doctor's going to walk through a whole bunch of stuff. The doctor never asks, okay, do you want me to fix you? It's going to cost X number of dollars. Do you want me to? They just do it, right? It just It's because it's a consultative, authoritative thing where the patient has come to them asking for a solution and asking for help because they, they're not happy about something. Right. It's not like we're going there and... Uh, right, right. So... Let me ask you this, then. If somebody were interested in the services that your company offers, tell us a little bit about where they would go and how they would get started. The best way to do it is to go to creativelydisruptive.com. Um, you can look for Creatively Disruptive um, on Facebook as well. You can have a look through the hundreds of uh, uh, reviews and recommendations that we've had. We've got five stars, you know, which is unusual for online marketing. Uh, they have five-star reviews on, on Facebook. Um, but we've we've got a five star average, uh, five out of five, and we've got about 130 something reviews. Um, have a look there. Go to creativelydisruptive.com. Um, if you want to look into me to see how what I am, go to LinkedIn. You can find me, Andy Seely, and you can actually I've got a whole bunch of recommendations from industry pros. So you can actually see what kind of person the CEO of Creatively Disruptive is and how the, how I operate, which I think is important when you're looking for digital marketing firms know how, what the attitude is of the CEO and, and, and what their beliefs are. Um, so you can do a little bit of due diligence into that, but reach out to us through creativelydisruptive.com. And, you know, the team is really good at finding, you know, really kind of like going through a process to find what you're looking for and, and what results you're looking to do and, and what's the best way to go about it. And we actually have a pretty foolproof process which involves a lot of research and planning before we actually ask you to spend any dollars on, on, on Google and Facebook and so forth, right? Because a little bit like a designer, right? You, there's a lot of planning and, 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 and figuring out what's the best way to go about it before I go and buy furniture and artwork and all the different things that could very quickly ex escalate into a lot of dollars, which could be absolutely wasted if I don't know what I'm doing. Right? How many times does a designer go into a house and go, okay, we probably need to get rid of this and this and this, and it's thousands of dollars worth of, of stuff that that house homeowners the purchase. It's very similar to digital marketing. You know, before you spend a penny on Facebook and Google, because they'll take every penny that you have and give you nothing back, we actually design and plan out the right path for you to actually get to where you want to be because we're very result focused. As, as you as a designer would be very result focused and getting the result for your clients. So reach out to us on Creatively Disruptive. If you are interested in learning about what we do, sign up to our um, small business course. You can pay nothing if you want. If you don't have any money, if you want to pay something, you can pay something, whatever you want. You can pay a million dollars or zero dollars, whatever you want. It'll allow you to, to see what we do. And you can, there's lots of classes. There's 90 something classes in there showing you how to do different things from a digital marketing standpoint, get an idea of what we're about, and then you could reach out to us, or maybe you'll learn enough to just do it yourself. Um, but like I said, our goal is to help those that just don't have the time or the inclination and to do it right the first time. And, and we're pretty good at it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy, for a really great conversation today, just being able to, to even hear and see and think about. Um, I think the thing that, um, has definitely got my attention is definitely some of that retargeting. So yeah. um, really just making sure that when people take the time to come to the website, that we're staying top of mind, because I clearly know that it works for my um, clothing budget at home and, and the Amazon delivery packages and other delivery packages that show up daily. So, you know, I want to make sure I'm using the, some of the same tactics that I know work. And it's, so. and it's the cheapest. It's one of the cheapest tactics 
to use. If you've got traffic coming to your website, make sure you're remarketing because it doesn't cost a lot. Right. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Well, um, I will put all of your links in our podcast notes. And so everybody will be able um, to get over to your website. And again, I just thank you for taking time to share today. Thanks for having me. Have a great one. Take care. Andy, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing. I know one of the things I probably need to go um, brush up on for sure is my remarketing campaign. So um, I just appreciate you even bringing these things to our attention. I also want to encourage each of you as you're listening to this podcast to think about what you can be intentional about. It's so easy to get caught up in the the busy and the day-to-day doing that we're not being intentional about the businesses that we're creating. That's one of the things that I love teaching business owners like yourselves um, in my in my courses and in my coaching. You know, the goal that I really have for you as you listen to this podcast or work with me is to make sure that you understand your financials. We call that financial fluency. You speak the language of the numbers so that you understand what's happening at all times and how to use those numbers to grow and scale up or to scale back or to scale sideways, whichever way you need to do it. It's also really important to me that you all understand that you're building a business of intention. So you're being very intentional, as we even talked about with Andy today, about who you draw to your business. And so what does that look like? And how do you put plans in place? And how do you even define what that is? And then I'm really, really high on you all having a strategic plan, which is that detailed plan that is usable that helps you move forward. And so all of this is covered in my coaching packages, whether you work with me um, as an elite member of my coaching business or whether you're in my designer's inner circle. If you want to know more also about how this has helped other businesses, you can check out the seven-figure case study that I have out on my website at scarletthreadconsulting.com. You'll find that um, in the top right uh, in multiple places on the website, but also under the resources tab. And if it sounds like something that you're ready to do and invest in to get, as we talked about today, the results that you want, I would love an opportunity to chat with you while you're on my website. Hop on over to um, the Work With Me page and then fill out a discovery form. And let's get on the phone and talk about how we really can move your business to the next level, because I'd love to be able to walk with you, journey with you and assist you. And um, just do all these things that you need to do a little at a time. You can't do everything at once. And just know step by step, you're going to make it further than if you don't do anything. So be profitable intentionally, because as we always say, profit doesn't happen by accident. Profit is a Choice is proud to be part of the designnetwork.org, where you can discover more design media reaching creative listeners. Thanks for listening and stay creative and business minded.